Hey there, Kyle here, and um, I'm actually not very certain who is joining me uh, in Steve's spot. So it I'm looks Steve's like Steve's younger brother. You can, actually, you can call me, um, I don't know, call me, call me Ben. Ben. <laughs> <Just with laughs> names. Yeah, well, you know, sure here's you the thing, look at I, I was I was out for the week, right? And so I was in LA and I was working on my tan and re recognized that, you know, I didn't want to have an upcoming, you know, e uneven. So I figured, ah, I'll shave it, see what happens. Maybe lose a few years. And plus, I'm not the whitest person on the show right now. English English guy here. So. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Dave. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I am so sorry. Uh, Steve <laughs> coming out the gate of uh, insulting the guest. How? What is that? Shocking. Okay. Shocking behavior. Oh, I told him before we went on air, it's going to be rough. I told him. I do <laughs> heads up. Well, let's say hello to uh, Mr. Ben Holland. Hello, Ben. Hi. So, yeah, I'm Ben. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Kyle and Steve for inviting me to the show. Um, my background is in physics, and I'm currently undertaking an undergraduate degree in meteorology and climate science. On a less academic note, I'm a rescue diver and emergency first responder, and my drink of choice is a June bug. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you all about climate change and whether we're past the point of no return. And I believe that we will be working on a Q and A style format. And with that, I'll pass the mic back to you guys. What now? Tell me, good, what actually. is a June bug? Yeah, that was that was that was great. What what is a June bug? Oh, thank you. Oh, a June bug. It is delicious. It is uh, Malibu. It is banana liqueur. It is lime cordial. It is. I'm doing a lot of shaking. It is. Um, what else is it? It's got Midori melon liqueur in it and pineapple juice, and it tastes like a calippo. Do you have those over there? No, but it sounds like a diabetic it's nightmare. Yeah, it it's great. Though. Like an ice folly. It's so delicious. Absolutely I, love I it. I like Ben already. Ben, I like you already. This hey. is going to be great. <laughs> this is going to be great. Um, so let me uh, let me just uh, go through a couple of announcements real quick. Um, next week, we are doing the uh, the Patreon week, uh, where each day you will be get uh, there will be a perk for you uh, who are patrons of the show and support the uh, show. This Saturday, we'll be talking more about that in the uh, private hangout, which will be Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern, um, and then to go through this week, uh, it's an exciting week. I'm very excited about this week. Uh, tomorrow we have um, Ned, who is the uh, he's the official prank caller guy from Bubba the Love Sponge, in the, this based out of Florida. It's a hilarious show. He does so many different uh, phone call pranks. It's unbelievable, but the guy is, uh, isn't he, Dave? He's amazing, right? He, he is. He's hilarious. <laughs> Sorry, I okay. don't well, Yeah. 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 He's good. He's good. Um, Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday uh, uh, on Twitter, Rational Blonde and uh, the Psy Babe, which are two amazing people, by the way. If you have not checked them out, you need to. But they do a podcast called Two Girls, One Mike. And the, uh, the premise of the show is that they watch and review porn. And not the actual uh, intercourse part of the porn, but the the buildup and the dialogue that exists in porn. And um, if you haven't checked them out, make sure that you do. It is amazing. They do amazing work. And we're going to have them on Wednesday at 9 p.m. to talk about what they do. And then uh, Thursday, Shannon and I will have uh, Aaron Ra on and um, a panel of um, uh, people rep representing the uh, the transgender community. We're going to be talking about um, recent events that have happened and taken place within the community, what what we can improve on, um, and each one of the, uh, the individuals on the panel hold different viewpoints. Some, uh, they don't even agree with each other. So we're all going to try to get to a um, sort of a, a middle ground and see what we can't um, discover about each other. That's Thursday at, at 9 p.m. And then on Friday, we'll have a little bit of a double header. Um, another one from the porn industry. This time it's a furry porn. Now, a lot of people have been looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to this. It's, um, it's a, a field that I didn't know existed until I looked into it. And when I looked into it, it very much does exist. Um, so we're going to be talking about that. And then uh, Noel Plum will be joining us uh, immediately following that. And we'll be talking to uh, Noel. And then, of course, on Saturday, Flatter Day. Um, Red's rhetoric wanted me to pass along a message that on June twenty second he will be live streaming the uh, the Falcon launch from SpaceX, and um, you can join him and 
go through that in real time. He's going to be doing that this again on June 22nd. Steve, you got anything? No, actually, uh, I didn't have anything planned this week. But if you haven't had a chance this morning, I actually had Dr. Jeff uh, Zurink from Reasons to Believe on. He's an astrophysicist that was uh, willing to come on. He had about 90 minutes for Ask a Philosopher, and he was just great. So if you guys haven't checked that out, go to my channel and uh, go watch that after this because it was really entertaining. I got to admit, he was he was amazingly uh, educated, I guess you could say the word. It's, it's <laughs> really intimidating when you talk to somebody who you know has had that much education. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, um, so Kyle, I just yo. wanted to mention that that, that launch on the twenty second, uh, Reds is stealing me from you. Yeah, he told me. He told me. I just want everyone fine. else to know. I know. Mm -hmm. I know it's fine. I um, want everybody to know. I'm being stolen. Okay. I'm being kidnapped. All right. Dave's being kidnapped. Everyone, put a bolo out. Be on the lookout. Producer on the run. Okay. Uh, so, climate change. Ben, how Hello. serious is it? Oh, it's uh, it's pretty important, yeah. Pretty big. Excellent. Well, why don't you take a second and um, you did a you did a phenomenal intro a few minutes ago, but um, tell us about sort of how you got into this and uh, why you think it's important. And then I'll start out with the uh, first question. Okay, so uh, I've been watching the show for a while, and I figured. I have some stuff to say. I figured I'd reach out, and um, I did. And uh, Carl decided that we would be doing climate change, and so that's what we're doing, <laughs> I guess. Perfect. And um, so let's start out with uh, how can global warming? This is a uh, this is probably one of the the biggest memes out there because it happened. Uh, even a congressman took a snowball into Congress to, to uh, demonstrate that. The, the the planet cannot be getting warmer if snow still exists. So how can global warming be happening when there are snowstorms still? Okay, so despite the fact that temperatures on average are increasing, you are still going to be getting snow. Snow uh, for sorry, temperatures tend to go by normal distribution. So you're always going to get tail ends that go really really high, and you're going to get tail ends that go really really low. And so even if the average te temperature just shifts slightly you're still going to get those really low temperatures and you're still going to get the snowstorms. If I give you an example about how actually um, global uh, warming could actually lead to more snowstorms, um, the Gulf Stream. So uh, you've got a region of, um, sorry, hang on. You've got a region of um, water in the Gulf of Mexico. It warms up, it then moves its way up the East Coast uh, in, and makes its way to Northern Europe. And it makes the temperatures in Western Europe higher than they normally would be. Um, you would think that if you heated up the Earth slightly, that there would be greater heat transfer happening through the Gulf Stream. Um, mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, this would actually cause um, Western Europe to get colder. Possibly, this could lead to Western Europe getting colder, because with this increase in global temperature, you're going to get more melting of land ice in Greenland, which is fresh, which will change. Which, when that mixes with the salt water, it's going to affect the salinity and the density of the water, which could lead to um, the Gulf Stream not actually being deflected, not actually going to Northern Europe or, you know, to going to where it is now. Where, if that would happen, uh, Western Europe would get colder. And as it gets colder, you're going to get more snowstorms. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, there's an example of how, how advanced global warming could actually lead to colder um, temperatures in mm -hmm. local, in regional areas. Cool. Uh, Steve, did you happen to see that where that, that congressman took, brought the snowball in? That wasn't the one where they tried to burn a snowball, was it? And they said, oh, it's caused by uh, what is it? No. Um, uh, chemtrails. It's like, oh, snow doesn't burn. Um, no, what was it? What? He, he was he literally was trying to argue that climate change wasn't a thing because he had snowballs. Yeah. I forget the guy's name. I forget, I forget which senator it was, but he, he said he was trying to make the point. He brought a cooler in, and yeah, in it, he pulled out a snowball, and he said, how can, the, how can the, the planet be getting warmer if we still have snow? Do they it's think that all so, of a sudden, like one or two degrees, is going to cause no snow to be in certain places? I don't know. It's, it's, it it baffles me. I don't, I don't it's not even that as much as that right now. Yeah, isn't it like one point eight degrees Celsius over the last uh, hundred some odd plus years? Uh, well, since the nineteen sixties average, it is uh, about point eight. Um, I would have to look at the graph for uh, to tell you about the last mm -hmm. hundred years. <laughs> 
Um, but yes, oh. it is higher than it was. What what sure. see what did you mean by um, someone trying to melt or burn a snowball? What what, what is that? <laughs> this is actually one of my greatest failures, actually, and I hate to tell this story. Actually, why do you have Burning to bring that up? Um, yeah, no, this was actually, it just took a long time for actually the people to figure this out, including myself and, and a lot of people who are in the physics um, back in the day on, on YouTube. But people were claiming that chemtrails were causing snow to be produced that you couldn't burn it. So what they would do is they'd take a lighter and they'd show that it just produces soot and it doesn't melt, okay? Because you would think that you put a lighter up something, it should melt, right? Well, I for some reason thought that had to do with sublimation because of my, my experience with physics. And so I have thought that for some reason it is sublimated from... Uh, solid form to gaseous form without having any liquid state. Seemed decent at the time, but having some experts come in and crunch the numbers, it's actually due to the fact it absorbs the water. So when you, you're you're putting the the lighter to the snow, it's actually porous, and so the the water that's being produced is actually being reabsorbed by the snowball. It has nothing to do with chemtrails. So we were trying to debunk chemtrails. My explanation was wrong, however, and I admitted I was wrong. I was humble. Humble. I I, I bow down to the actual experts in physics and oh um, I, I prostrated myself and yeah it was it was only you painful. would get into an argument with somebody about melting a snowball that is but such you know what you know what they showed me I was wrong a thing. That is such a steep the, physics thing. is physics right i mean they show me that the physics was incorrect what are they going to do sure you're right <laughs> okay <laughs> um <laughs> all right so uh has the earth has the earth's temperature uh risen or lowered in the past 15 years I've already answered that. Um, <laughs> without a doubt, it has increased. Uh, I mean, you can just look at recent temperature records. Um, it's it's gone from uh, 0.53 to 0.82 above the 1960 average. Sorry, that's degrees uh, Celsius uh, um, above the 1960 average, which you know is a is an increase of 0.3 degrees Celsius. It's yeah, it's increased. <laughs> and actually, mm -hmm. if you look at if you look at the, the graph, it's this is just about the fastest. Uh, rate of increase in temperature that we've ever had it's kind of scary mm -hmm. <laughs> um now the uh, another uh, contentious issue among uh, everyone is and why there's so much i think uh, just competing views on this is the it seems that there is a or some people will say that there is a um a lack of consensus among scientists is that true or is science pretty solid on this okay so look, depending on who takes the survey this value changes so there is no way to survey every single scientist unless you made everyone on earth take the survey what we have noticed is that the greater the climate expertise amongst those surveyed the higher the consensus on human caused climate change it appears that the average uh, is 97 percent of scientists agree that the situation everyone is making so much noise about is uh, human caused However, uh, five surveys of peer-reviewed literature between um, the years of 1991 and 2015, uh, the average consensus was shown to be 99.94%, which is much tighter than the stated 97%. However, one thing that absolutely baffles me, you can get <laughs> heads of countries elected with 30% like majority. That's mm. all you need. Can you mm. imagine if you, ha if you had agreement of 97% amongst your voting population. Can you imagine if 97% 90%, of Americans decided, you know what, we don't want guns anymore, so we're going to ban guns. The guns would be banned, because that would be a consensus. Mm -hmm. So it, I just think it's a bit nuts that people think that 97%, I mean, geez, even 80% is, is yeah. still would be crazy. <laughs> so, so, so evolution is 99.7%, and people still think evolution is a, isn't a consensus. Of course it is. Yeah, Essentially, we're, we're holding out for the 3% that, that are Go, uh, going against the 97 percent and and he's right, right though in what other world would that make sense honestly it, it, you know there's, there's some it, it things as well like uh, just had it what was it oh it's literally just it's li literally it was right there on my mind and then it was gone I uh, keep it free, and, and i'll come back to that well <laughs> it's, it's not how you do statistics look at it if you have if you're three standard deviations out which is 99 uh 90 what is it 90 97 97.5 uh, yeah. uh yeah so i mean if anything around that three standard deviations is not really going to be any difference because you got an error factor anyways. So if you sample a certain amount of people, you just say you sample a couple thousand people and you have a population of 100,000 and scientists, that's enough to make a statistical inference that it is mm. consensus. That is how statistical mm. inference is done. So if you're around 96, 97, 98%, boom, you're, you got it. I mean, that's well within any 
any measurable uh, accounting for for what you would consider to be any kind of consensus. Absolutely. Okay, Steve, let me let me ask you then, Steve. Why is it that um, there are people who are choosing to go with a three percent versus a ninety seven percent? Like, what do they have to gain from going against this? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, well, what's the what's their narrative when ninety seven percent of science says this is the case? Like your buddy here, um, Artisan Tony. Hi, Tony. You can, are you supposed to say something derogatory? Oh, uh, fuck you, Artisan Tony. Hey, Tony. So you had to get that in there. Um, so like he's saying it's like a political issue, right? And I, and I think it is political, but I also think it's scientific. He says Steve should be curating about the science, not the politics. Well, actually, I care about both, by the way. I may not talk about politics a lot. doesn't mean I don't care about it. Uh, but it is a scientific factor that we have to realize. In fact, we're living in a, in a planet that is literally going to the brink of, of, of extermination for the human race if, if things are not changed very quickly. So I do believe that very strongly. So the people that are holding out the three percenters or whatever it is, I think they want, I don't think they want to face reality. I don't think they want to have to recognize that these are doomsday level scenarios. And I'm not, you know, I'm not an alarmist, but I think when it comes to climate change, if we do not change the way we're going, um, I don't think that life is where you know it in the next couple hundred years is going to be anything like it is now. And we're going to get into that. Um, so, Ben, there the next question. Yeah. Well. There, there is one oh, more yeah, thing please. as well. Um, of that 3%, some of those people will have been doing research papers that will have been funded by um, oil, the oil industry. Um, Fair enough. And mm. also another one is um, everyone has their own level of evidence they require before they will accept something as truth. And so you could argue that maybe some of these people just are, say that there is not enough evidence to satisfy their requirements. Um, and until they have some overwhelming amount of evidence, they will not accept it. So they may not be saying um, that it's definitely not human caused, but they may just be saying there is not enough evidence to say it is human caused. Sure. Got it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I don't buy that though. <laughs> uh, Even though yeah, I don't either. It's... yeah. It's baffling. Um, it's it's hard enough for scientists to predict the weather today. Oftentimes, people do that with like when it snows or whatever, and it doesn't wind up happening, or they're they're you know just off. Um, yep. Much uh, uh, much less the climate. How do they know what the temperature was like five hundred years ago? All right. And we so I love this question. I absolutely love this question because it does come up quite a bit. It is an appeal to emotion rather than facts, and it, it implies that climate predictions decades into the future cannot possibly be right when the weather forecast for the next day have have some uncertainty. Uh, I mean, in truth, short-term weather forecasts are actually really accurate and have improved dramatically over the past three dec decades. The problem is weather forecast depends on initial conditions, and even slight uncertainties in those conditions can create hugely different outcomes, say, two weeks down the line. Um, mm -hmm. Weather predictions are telling you exactly what and when things are going to happen, whereas climate predictions tell you averages. To know the global, what the te uh, to know what the global temperature will be like in ten years time, you um you don't need to know whether or not it will be cloudy on the day. Uh, but for weather predictions, that kind of detail is essential. Um, uh, so uh, an, an analogy I like to go with is that if you imagine a swimming pool and it's being slowly filled with water, you then dive into the pool. All the waves that you then created are uh, the weather, um, whereas the water level is the climate, and it's slowly increasing. And, and the two are completely different measures, and, and they don't have anything to do with each other. Mm. Uh, to answer your second point, um, how do we know what the temperature or climate was like 500 years ago? Um, we can drill into the ice in places like Greenland and Antarctica and take ice cores. So basically, these are these are big tubes of ice that are several meters long, and these cores they they're, they're created for a really, really long time through the annual build-up of snow. Uh, and as a result, uh, the lower layers are older and the higher layers are younger. And as they're forming, um, small bubbles of gas get trapped inside these layers and it, it kind of essentially traps a little bit of the atmosphere in, in them at the time of the layer being created. So when we then analyze these gas bubbles, we can then see what the molecular composition of the atmosphere was like at, uh, all that time ago. So that tells you what the atmosphere was like. Now, another thing we use is um, testimo te testimo uh, testimonies written by people who were around. So over time, we've gotten better at taking records and measurements. So as a result, we've gotten better and better written testimonies 
of what the weather was like in the past. So these records started properly being taken by the British in 1659, but that was only in England. It wasn't mm -hmm. until the mid 1800s that the British Empire began taking the readings globally, uh, by which I mean uh, Europe, uh, India, Australia, and South Africa. But when it really kicked off and everyone started doing it, it was the Second World War. So we've got those written records. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I actually myself, uh, I've uh, looked at this. So I was looking to do something for the department over summer last year. And uh, so I emailed my tutor and he put me in uh, in contact with another one who he works on a program where they try, they, they focus on digitizing uh, old logbooks of weather data. And literally th these are like logbooks that were taken like on ships, uh, in weather stations all around different parts of the world when the British Empire was still, you know, a thing. Um, and literally the only form we have them in is these logbooks. I mean, I have them on scans, but they're not usable as data. So what he had me do was literally type out 17,000 data points. <laughs> oh. um, it took a long time. And that was one year of data, 17,000 data points. That was wet and dry bulb temperature and pressure. And uh, yeah, there was way more information on the logbooks, but all, all he wanted was those. Uh, and that uh, that was for the year 1900 to 1901. And I mean, that just shows you that, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, it's been a tri like the the success of the British Empire has been attributed to you know uh, their ability of making lists basically, <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, and that's uh, you know a good example of it. Sorry. Anyway, sure. uh, enough about that story stuff. So another thing we use is we use uh, dendrochronology. So tree rings change in thickness. Uh, so tree rings grow, trees grow rings every year. Uh, well, not necessarily every year. They sometimes might grow two. They might not grow one some year. But most of the time, it's generally it's pretty consistent. They will grow one every year. And these tree rings will change in thickness depending on conditions throughout the year. So this tells us things like temperature and rainfall. Um, the oldest trees we have available are dated to be between 12,580, I think, years and 13,900 years old. Um, so we've got plenty of trees that will fit with that. Uh, in, for this question. Um, so yeah, when you combine all these things together, that's how you then get a good picture of what was going on. Sure. Steve, anything you want to fill in on that? Yeah, no, I, I, like, I like the way you, you put the consilience there between like ice cores and dendrochronology. Um, as you said, when it comes to tree rings, um, they not, may not annually grow every year, and only certain types of trees do have these annual rings. And sometimes they have two rings, sometimes they have one ring, sometimes they have no rings. But it also could determine how long your your seasons were. If your summer was exceptionally long, it'll be a little bit darker. If it's if it's a you know dry or this, so each tree has a record of the climate conditions for decades and decades, if not hundreds of years. Uh, that. You can go and you can look at each tree in this area in this little group, right? And so, if that corresponds to what we would expect to find based upon the gas chronography of the ice cores, then of course, hey, look, there's a consilience there. They match, right? We don't have opposing data, so all the all this evidence for climate change is the case that it's all pointing to the same thing. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but I don't know yeah. any evidence that says that it's not. There's nothing. Uh, there's no outlier at, at all in any of this stuff. Uh, even coral reefs. I know either. same thing. Yeah, not that I know of either. Right, I mean, coral reefs, it's the same thing. I got to count some tree rings. I really enjoyed it. It's kind of nerdy, but um, one of the modules we did, <laughs> oh, it was so much fun. It was literally just like, we got to do tree rings. We got to look at like mammoth teeth uh, and we got to date those. Uh, we just got to do loads of things. We got to look at skulls and early like human tools. They were so freaking cool, like little arrowheads. And then they went through a period of just like, you know, making penises and stuff, which is a little bit weird, but it was so cool, all of it. <laughs> penises are cool. Uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Penises are cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like um, penises. You know, people... <laughs> Let's see. Uh, if the planet is getting warmer, why do um, some news sources say that the ice at the poles is increasing? Ooh. Okay. So it is. When they say that, it is. It is definitely supposed to be misleading. Um, yes. There is a section of Antarctica that is, the amount of ice that is increasing. It is the, the sea ice is increasing. However, on the eastern side of Antarctica, the land ice is actually receding, and it's receding way faster than the the, the amount that the um the sea ice is increasing. Uh, the sea ice is actually increasing despite waters around it being warmer than they normally are. 
Um, but yeah, it's completely outweighed by it. I mean, um, between 1992 and 2011, the Antarctic, the Antarctic ice shelf lost uh, 1,350 gigatons or uh, 1 quadrillion, 350 trillion tons of ice. So yeah, whilst uh, Antarctic sea ice levels are increasing, uh, yeah, to total is decreasing. And that doesn't even include the amount, the rate at which ice is being lost from Greenland, which is really substantial. Uh, <laughs> the rate at which ice is being lost there is, is, is increasing rapidly. And we know this because of ice cores we've taken in Greenland um, and they show a significant spike in ice melting in the last 20 years. Hmm. You know, I, I've got to say, just from, from monitoring the chat and, and, and going back and forth on, you know, climate change between some people is uh, a very contentious issue. However, that has been eclipsed, I think, in controversy uh, compared to Steve's beard. Steve's, it appears your beard is the yeah. most, uh, <laughs> most, most people agree with that. They're, they're, they're seriously having existential crises about my beard. Um, I like that. It's, <laughs> they're mostly agreeing with you, like Ben, but the, the, the no. beard thing, they're having, right. they're having much... Who knew? Yeah, you're not even controversial. What the hell? It would take Steve's beard <laughs> to bring us all together on climate change. I, oh, you you're know what, Ben? Remember I told you about the terraforming? Remember, remember I told you about not talking about the terraforming from the aliens? Talk about the oh, terraforming yes, yeah. oh, sorry, from the aliens. Oh, um, so let me in. ask you this real quick. So the... Um, the ice melting kind of thing, right? Uh, recently, there's been a huge thing about permafrost being uh, basically going yes. away. Permafrost is a permanent layer of frost. It's you know you're freezing about 50 meters, 100 meters um, thickness. This is pretty substantial if you think about it. Now that's mm -hmm. starting to melt, right? Um, that's affecting a lot of things, including soil composites. You know, it's affecting the the water layer level. So what would happen if we lost the permafrost layer pretty much completely, and the ocean levels were rising because of the melting of the glaciers. How would that affect our overall coastline, especially from areas like for our dear friend, Reds Redrick, who happens to live in Florida. Um, yeah. Would he be like snorkeling or something? Would he be like dog paddling? Uh, I, mean, I, I, I honestly don't know how much uh, the water level would rise. I haven't actually looked at that. Uh, I can tell you though, it would be pretty bad with the uh, permaf permafrost melting because it contains a lot of CO2, uh, sorry, methane. And, um, that's yep. a bad one. <laughs> carbon dioxide. Uh, so that's going to that's going to exacerbate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's 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 really bad that the permafrost is melting as quick as it is. It's going much faster than we were expecting. Uh, someone's just noticed that I have three different drinks. I was waiting for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know how how much the levels would change, but I I do know that um, yeah, the the world would look different. Um, I, I'll tell you about. I would I would guess when I looked into on. this. Hold on, guys. Um, ben, you you just acknowledged that people were asking about you having three different drinks, but people want to know what are you drinking? What are they? Yeah, what are they? Okay, so um, in one I have water because you know I'm talking. Um, it's just That's sensible. <laughs> in the other, I've got an energy drink because it's two in the morning here. And the other beer. one I have good old tea. Oh, and excellent. Sure we'll tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, which, which I think we could get into a, a whole discussion about uh, the biscuits and cookies thing. Oh, I wish I could, but I can't because I'm celiac. I can't eat biscuits. Oh, I'm so sorry. I somehow get into the conversation. You and you do not drink your own <laughs> pee, right? We got to go make sure that we, uh, we are on the same page. Only on Sunday. Not a free man on the land. Okay. okay not hey. a free man on the land. No, no judgment here. So we, we were getting into drink. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not drinking pee, whatever. <laughs> We're, we're getting we were getting into a little bit about what the next question was, um, which is how harmful is CO two? Uh, how harmful is CO two? So, um, hang on, sorry, that was uh, I think you skipped a question. I did, but I, I'm just tailing it in on the because we we just uh, we were just talking about that, so it kind of. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, so um, give me a sec. Um, well, to us, CO2 isn't actually all that bad. The amount that we would have, uh, we, the amount that we are talking, you'd ha have to, uh, you'd have to significantly increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere for humans to start mm -hmm. choking on the air we breathe. I mean, I actually gained some experience in this. Uh, I like to uh, test things myself, and um, I was doing an experiment uh, back when I was doing physics on the refractive, refractive index of different gases. 
And so these gases have different densities. And so I figured, oh, look, helium, when you breathe that in, it uh, makes your voice go really squeaky and high. And so I figured, oh, look, CO2, that's going to make my, that's really dense. It's going to make my voice go really deep. And <laughs> basically, I'm an idiot. So I breathed in 100% CO2. And uh, I then spent the next 30 minutes with a pounding headache lying on the floor of the lab, um, which <laughs> was not fun. <laughs> like, literally, I just felt tired. But there was well, that's some your hyper You don't want to breathe in CO2. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, it's, it's not great for you, but it, it won't kill you immediately. There are some gases that will do that. But there was some good that came from it because I now know that the fizz in fizzy drinks is literally the taste of CO2. When you taste that fizz flavor, that's literally what CO2 tastes like. And it was so weird because it was like I was tasting the fizz of a drink, but there was no liquid. It, it didn't feel yeah, like carbonic, carbonic acid that will result yeah. in carbon dioxide. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it just immediately uh, dissolved into the saliva on my, on my tongue, I guess. Wow. It's lovely. Image. That's crazy. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's um, fine. Anyway, sorry. Um, um, oh, um, sorry. Story time of Ben aside. Um, the real problem with there being so much CO2 in the atmosphere apart from it warming the atmosphere, is that CO2 dissolves in water to become carbonic acid, as you said, Steve. So when there is more CO2 in the atmosphere dissolving into the water than, than there is coming out of the water, you get ocean, ocean acidification. And this causes just a whole myriad, myriad of problems. Uh, for one, um, the Great Barrier Reef has been decimated by coral bleaching as a result of this as acid, um, sorry, ocean acidification. And this basically just results in huge swathes of reef, uh, huge, uh, um, swathes of reef basically being devoid of life where it was once teeming and it will take hundreds if not thousands of years for it to get back to, to to recover back to where it was um and that's only if we really change the way we make energy and, and the way and the way we make, make our goods we buy right now mm -hmm. um on a slightly more positive note phytoplankton the organisms that basically make all the um all the uh, oxygen that we breathe uh contrary to popular belief the uh, Amazon rainforest is not the lungs of the of the world; it is the ocean. Um, these phytoplankton uh, probably will survive, uh, even with climate change. They've um, done experiments with them, and it looks like they actually adapt fairly quickly. Uh, and their shells they make them thicker, and so they just kind of they get through just fine. But this isn't okay for everything else because we're already noticing seashells uh, are suffering. Uh, they have uh, extensive corrosion damage already from the present amounts of um, acidity in the ocean. And it's just not great, really. I like things like seashell, like, um, I don't know, I can't remember what they're called now, um, scallops um, mm -hmm. and other creatures like that, they're going to really struggle. Um, fish, um, I actually, they're going to be dramatically affected, but some of them will, it seems like, will probably be fine, maybe be fine, other ones won't be. Um, the lower the pH of the water causes huge biological changes in these animals, and most of them are detrimental. We don't really quite understand the extent to which the damage will go, but we could definitely expect major shifts in the food webs in the ocean with increasing acidity. Uh, I believe it's, uh, I think it's clownfish. Um, mm -hmm. They usually find them, they usually find like safe, um, safety in sea anemones, but when they increase the, uh, acidity, I think. This is clownfish. I might be wrong on this. Yeah, clown, um, clownfish, they, clownfish live in the enemy, sea anemones, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, the, effect, the effect that is noticed when you increase, oh. increase um, acidity, it looks, I, th the, I think the clownfish, they stop seeking them, the, the safety of that when predators are around, when you increase the acidity very slightly, and that could cause real problems for them. That's amazing that, that something like that could, you know, that have that much of a, a, an impact. Um, well, it's huge. Oh, these I mean, little, like the ocean yeah. hasn't changed very much, and so they've adapted very well to that. Sure. So here's the uh, here's the the million dollar question, the um, the one where everybody stands to well, three percent of people stand divided. <laughs> Is climate change mankind's fault? Is climate change mankind's fault? Is it due to mankind? Um, okay, if we are talking climate change with lower seas, then no. Um, the climate is constantly slowly changing due to changes in Earth's orbit, which is the Milankovitch uh, cycle, uh, plant dominance, algal, and phytoplankton levels. However, if we're talking climate change with uppercase seas, the hotly talked about situation we find ourselves in now, um, then it is without a doubt in my mind that it is anthropogenic. 
Um, the temperature profile records show that with the invention of the internal combustion engine and the use of coal and other fossil fuels to power and heat our homes and cars, mm -hmm. the temperature has been rapidly increasing and even worse, the rate at which it's increasing is increasing. Now, that might just be a coincidence, but saying it is a coincidence is a little bit like saying you've got your boat, it's got a hole in it, boat sinking, but the two events are completely unrelated. Um, mm. Now, of course, you know, me saying that, me saying that you know, um, humans are causing this with their emissions does require some kind of ed evidence so uh, that the release of fossil fuel emissions can cause an increase in temperature. So I'm going to give you that a little bit now. Um, the five main gases we're worried about that uh, respond that are responsible for the increase in temperature are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and CFCs. Um, so mm. I'm going to start off with water vapor. What, the problem with water vapor is it creates a positive feedback cycle. The hotter it is, the more evaporation occurs from the ocean, the more evaporation that occurs, uh, the more water vapor there is, and so the more absorption of energy that occurs, thus the more hot it gets, and so on. Um, it's just a positive feedback loop. CO2, CO2 currently gets naturally released into the atmosphere through a combination of decomposing plants and animal matter, volcanoes and respiration, uh, both animal and plant-based. It is then reabsorbed by plants and animals growing. Uh, and it's taken in by plants and phytoplankton in the process of photosynthesis. And it's a closed loop, and it's fairly stable. Um, the problem is, since we've started burning fuels, we have been adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere without actually taking, uh, having, uh, without actually taking it out in any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. um, so we are therefore increasing the levels of carbon dioxide, which um, is really not great because CO2 traps infrared radiation. Um, emitted from the Earth's surface in the atmosphere, um, which then, when it gets absorbed, it energizes the molecules, which provides more kinetic energy, and as a result, temperature increases. Um, yeah, uh, so moving on to nitrous oxide, uh, this is produced in soil uh, cultivation practices, uh, farmers using fertilizers. Um, it's also emitted from car exhausts uh, and fossil fuel power plants that use coal or oil. Um, and the real reason it's a problem is because it is a much more effective greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Uh, this is because carbon dioxide is quite a bit of it in the atmosphere, which is fine. Um, but you kind of get diminishing returns over time because all the light that was going to be absorbed by the carbon dioxide is probably already being absorbed. So you're the only amount that's getting away, uh, you're only stopping a little bit more each time when you add another molecule. Um, whereas with nitrous oxide, there's much less of it in the atmosphere. And so um, when you put any more of that in, you're suddenly absorbing a whole bunch of light that wasn't getting absorbed before. Um, and so it's a real problem for that. The other problem with it is uh, to get rid of it, um, the process um, the, to remove it uh, depletes ozone from the atmosphere. And so it's kind of a double whammy greenhouse gas. Um, but, and without removing it artificially, it takes about 110 years for it to naturally decompose. Um, so yeah, we kind of want to get rid of it. Um, sure. And then on to the final one, uh, Steve, you probably know about this one a little bit more, Kyle, maybe uh, not. Carbon, <laughs> carbon fluorocarbon, <laughs> which would be uh, broken down into uh, PFCs and HFCs for the hydro, uh, what is it, um, hydrofluorocarbons. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so these were a, a, a huge problem way long ago in the past. You know, Steve would remember it well. And um, they were used Back extensively. The when, when we had PFCs and tetrafluoride, uh, uh, press airs used to have them. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were using fridges and aerosols. Um, that was a good zinger. So, and they just literally wreck the ozone there. They just literally punch a hole straight through. And, um, yeah. and you know, nobody needs that. I'm old. Thank um, you for reminding me. Appreciate it. Huh? Sorry? I'm old. Thank you okay. for reminding me of those days. <laughs> um, <laughs> my flatmates tell me I'm old because they're all like five years younger than me. Um, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, the, the, the CFCs were actually banned in, in a lot of places, right? So, so you're not allowed to use yeah. them for certain things, something like Freon, right? Um, but the PFCs, which we actually were meant to replace the CFCs, were used in semiconductors, and they had the same problem. Can I, can I take so, a story? Uh, like, like, here's, a, they had a problem. here's an interesting, uh, here's an interesting bit of, uh, a bit of um, trivia for you. The guy that actually um, is, is credited for uh, doing the CFCs and like hairspray and all that back in the whenever that first started, um, he then went on to uh, be the guy that, that suggested that lead be put in gas, right? Yeah. Because at the time that was supposed, it, it was supposed to, you know, make the, the, the noise and the, the engine a little bit, uh, yeah. a little bit quieter. Um, that was a bad yeah. thing. So the same guy who had these two things under his belt, the then, 
<laughs> he became worse, a quadri- trust me. Yeah, he, he became a quadriplegic. So um, he was in his bed, and he had invented this like uh, this pulley system that allowed him to like you know get up and, and move and that sort of thing. And uh, the the caretaker went in one day and found that he had uh, gotten himself wrapped up in it, and it strangled him to death. So I mean, what uh, a tragic. I, wait, I heard it was autoerotic right? asphyxiation. Did you hear that? No. I thought it was autoerotic asphyxiation. Okay, so he just I mean, got, it, caught, it, caught in the point. It could have been. I don't know. But I'm just saying, like, he, like all three of his yeah. inventions were just awful. Yeah. Like, bad, really <laughs> bad inventions. Bad ideas. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Were you, did you have any more? I, I do have a little bit more to say about the sure. ozone holes and stuff. I mean, so there was a bit there was there is still um a big hole over antarctica and um it's kind of it's seasonally active so every now and then it kicks a big pot like hole uh, up over new zealand um and i have family in new zealand and so i've i've been there a couple times and uh yeah i don't burn anywhere except for new zealand at all um it, it's it's actually insane you can literally be outside for 15 minutes and depending on when you're there you can literally just burn for like no reason um wow. and yeah, it's just a bit nuts, really. But fortunately, the good thing is, you know since the they faced it out. Is? Sorry, say again. Do you have an idea? Do you have an idea what the UV index is? For example, when we were up, we were at three thousand feet the other day, um, and we were checking the the climate and stuff like that. It was we were at a UV index of nine. Um, that's considered to be very high. You know back fifteen minutes of exposure to to somebody like like us, we're going to start to burn. Um, this is one of the reasons I got a tan because I mean I was up there for quite some time. But uh, yeah, it, with a very high UV index, it doesn't take long. I mean, even Kyle, he's slightly tanned. Thirty minutes, and he's going to be like mine spray. Yeah, but, uh, spray tanned. I, I always wonder with Kyle. You, know, you, don't do the, you don't do the Trump thing, do you? You think first Trump <laughs> spray? He's got the glove. I had, a date. <laughs> I had a date this past weekend. I had a date this past weekend. I had to. I had to be in in my you know top form. This is this is completely artificial. No UV, no UV. No skin cells were harmed in the making of this tan. The good, the good thing though is that um, since we phased it out, the hole does seem to be getting a little bit smaller, and it should kind, of, it should actually possibly be gone by around twenty fifty, which would be quite nice. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Um. So. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, sorry. And, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, you you asked me a question. I need to finish it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um. All in all, it would be fairly dubious to say that humans have played no role in creating this issue. There are there are just too many things, um, yeah, that we that we do that contribute uh, and that and that have an effect. Um, yeah, so I would say, yes, we certainly play a role. I um, I'd say quite I, I would, yeah, I, I I would question this is this wasn't one of the uh, the questions, but um, at just the two the two of you opinion, what would be the motivation for people who fight back against this? The statement that climate change is man-made like to what right. end are they trying to like what's the what's the deal here big business coal coal and gas is a big big factor and like you said ben they they have paid for studies and i'm convinced that they have studies that have been influenced by the lot by this these organizations i'm i'm not trying they to be conspiratorial I, I have to get to that yeah do you agree with that mm, they, did, they did the same thing with smoking Hmm. So I, mean, I would not, you know, yeah. That's a very good point. Um, also, I, I got into a, I, this is just an aside too, but I got into a conversation the other day, and I think the, this the, this should be a show because um, it's fascinating. Uh, someone said told me that I need to look into the, uh, the, the fuel industry and the fact that why we don't have a car that can't run on anything but gas and that there was a car back in the 70s i believe that could do that and the uh it was quickly pulled um no mention of it since then and the plans to it were scrapped and um the lobby is so big now it with the the, the fossil the you know the oil industry that these sort of vehicles that could run on any on something other than and gas are essentially crushed and not able to sort of bring to market. And I find that to be just absolutely fascinating. Steve, you were around in the 70s. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the thing. Look, we've had, a, I, and I mentioned this before, and I got some flack for it, and then I actually found the, the patent for this um, to, to verify it, because I do remember the story. We had carburetors that got 20, 200 miles to the gallon. 
200 miles to the gallon. We have technologies that can get a lot more efficiency than we're having now. Um, I don't know if it's by design anymore that we don't have you know more efficient engines. But yeah, I, I think that probably we did have some kind of technologies like that. But back in the 70s, these, most of them were um, leaded gas, right? And they weren't um, the non-leaded with emissions, and you didn't have the smog control, and you didn't have any of those factors. Uh, so they were very pollutant. But we probably had a lot more efficiency than 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 they let on. I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. Hmm. Interesting. I'll look into that then. Uh, bring somebody that can argue that. So, uh, Ben, what's the harm? What's the most harm that can come if the temperature uh, raised or was increased a couple of degrees? Like, what's what's the worst that can happen in in the? Oh, you know, it's, it's obviously nothing really, is it? Uh, no. Um, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, the worst that could happen is that um, every pretty much like everyone dies. No, okay, it's not quite as bad as that. Oh, great. But um, worst case, it's looking like around 40% of the global population is at risk of dying um, due to overheating for about 14 days of the year in only 90 years' time. Uh, that's my generation's kids and grandkids. Uh, at the rate we are going, we can expect an additional 250,000 deaths annu annually from heat stress and dehydration between the years 2030 and 2050, which uh, is not far away. And... Uh, hmm. Economically speaking, because obviously that's what makes the world go around, uh, this is expected to affect the health and agriculture industries to the tune of about two to four billion US dollars every year. Um, areas of poor with poor infrastructure can expect massive death tolls without adequate medical care, and this won't just affect the third world. Imagine if Puerto Rico, for example, was hit by another a series of hurricanes as it was in 2017. Um, in my opinion, the response time on that was just way too slow, and it would only be worse in the coming years. Not only will people be at risk of dying due to heat exhaustion more, uh, you can expect more numerous and more powerful hurricanes uh, as time goes on. Uh, hurricanes gain their energy from warm waters, and even slight increases in temperature can lead to more uh, can lead to devastating increases in power of these storms. Um, obviously, not just Puerto Rico will be affected, though. The entire Gulf will be hit harder and more often as the hurricanes will be stronger. They will be able to make their way further inland. Carl, you're in trouble. They might be able to make their way even up to North Carolina. Um, so yeah, good luck I with know. that. Um, I, other I about three of them. last last Sorry, year, three of, three of them took me out for uh, for days. Last yeah, year. I remember. Uh, I think I remember that actually. Yeah, I was out for you like. Just kind of disappeared. <laughs> yeah, I, I, literally, that's what happens when you. Um, and you know what though? Here's the thing though, everyone. The jokes on the uh, the jokes are on the hurricanes this year, because I have a. Um, AT and T has these like uh, you pay, I think it's like seven ninety nine a month, seven dollars ninety nine cents a month. But it's a um, it's a Wi Fi box. So if the power goes out, you just flip that thing on, and you've got Wi Fi. So fuck but you, hurricane. Do you realize you're still being affected by that because you're now paying seven ninety nine a month that you wouldn't necessarily have to be paying. That's a small price to pay for Wi Fi. Wi Fi is fair enough, I guess. <laughs> Wait, is that additional to what you pay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, like I said, yeah. So weather systems are going to get worse. Um, you're going to get more storms. Um, worst case, a lot of people die. Uh, humans will survive, uh, but the poorest people will be hit worst. Potentially, entire parts of continents will be left in hospital. You know, if you think the refugee crisis is bad now, uh, yeah, just you wait. Uh, not even a war will stop them. Hmm. See, so you have I mean, mentioned you something about. You'd literally have to have people on the walls with guns. It would be awful. Um, just people trying to get away from areas where they literally can't live. They will die if they stay there. And, you know, I would leave if I, if, if, if I had to. You know, like, I think everyone would leave if they had to. And it's just, yeah. We can, we can I, prevent I this. The, uh, the, 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 the phytoplankton in, in, in the oceans, you said that some of it would actually adapt to something like that, which would probably be, probably be true. But I, I think you neglected to mention anything about the changes of fishers, of the fisheries, and and uh, the fish that cannot acclimate. Um, some of the larger yeah. fishes, tunas and things of that nature, um, not going to survive. They're just they're not going to survive. Yeah. You're going to have a massive, you're gonna have massive deaths. Um, the oceans, I don't think, would be recoverable if there is a significant amount of uh, climate change. That's a, that it's not just going to be the the plankton, whether that survives or not. That that is going to be a big factor. Going to be wrong if that goes, then everything's dead. But I think a lot of the larger things that humans would survive on uh, would just go away. We're going to have a huge problem with, with food as well. Yep. 
there'll be huge loss, losses in um, arable land. Uh, one thing I've heard, some people seem to think that, you know, melting ice caps is great because, you know, additional trade routes. And I've heard one one uh, one source saying that uh, a tra tra trade routes like over Greenland will become possible. And that's really great. Uh, by that time, none of the land in northern Canada will be like livable in. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> Canada to play, they're, they're done. <laughs> Nova Scotia yeah. gone. Yeah, exactly. Gone. <laughs> Bye, Shannon. Bye, Paul. Move to Vancouver, guys. Go go on the other side. Yeah. Um. So, uh, is it too late to it too late? Uh, um, damage? Uh. Well, I mean, it depends on how you define reverse. In this case, um, can we mitigate yeah, the damages and go back to where we were a hundred years ago? Yeah. It will take probably several thousands of years, though, to completely repair the damage. I, I'm, I'm including the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef in that. Um, uh, and that's if we stop all current factory processes and switch to a carbon neutral process. Uh, I mean, if we could, like, we could switch to um, carbon negative concrete. Uh, a friend, uh, one of my housemates, keeps on harping on about that. And I haven't actually looked into it, but supposedly it's a thing. And that'd be really great. Um, so we'd have to radically change the way we make power and how we make things. And if we don't, really bad stuff's going to happen. Um, fortunately, it does seem like some governments are taking action. Uh, Costa Rica, for example, has produced 98.1% of its total energy requirement from new renewable sources. In the last four years, 98.5% of its energy has been from renewable sources. Iceland and Sweden are both planning to go to 100% renewable in the next few years. Uh, where I'm from in the United Kingdom, sometimes we produce enough wind power to power every home in Scotland, and then some, uh, although there's not most of the population is not living in Scotland, um, mm -hmm. but it's still a step in the right direction. Overall, I'd say we're not doing enough, but I am glad to learn that um, we now produce more power through wind turbines than coal plants, although we still have some way to go with natural gas because that is the, the dominant. I, really? Because uh, I, I, I think that'd be a very odd claim to make because uh, wind power, I used to work at a couple of different plants and uh, one of the plants we worked at um, was a biomass steam plant. We actually imported some actual things from the wind turbines turbines that were up in near the San Gabriel Valley, and then actually got shipped to, to Arizona in the in the power grid. That was less than one percent of the total amount of power. Um, it, it's still, in, especially in the United States, way primarily coal uh, by anything is coal. But also we have some nuclear. But the nuclear is only very localized, like San Onofre, San Diablo. San Diablo. Now I'm a big fan of nuclear energy, right? Obviously, that's I like it too. education. Um, it is, I think, one of the safest, cleanest, and just m more, more bang for your buck is the power density. Although, it, if it does go bad, then there's obviously a problem. But uh, how, how would you think about renewable? Most of the time, uh, well, uh, it's like, for example, Chernobyl was, th was human error and also Three Mile Island. Was yeah, but human Chernobyl error. was completely different. Chernobyl was literally a plutonium making factory in a warehouse. It was just awful. <laughs> like, it was just a poor thing. <laughs> like, right in the height of the Cold War, it was just rubbish. <laughs> it was very bad design. No, no, it really was. There was Chernobyl had something called a positive reactivity coefficient addition rate. And what that basically means that as the reactor gets hotter, you have to fight to keep the reactor from running away from right? literally going out of control. That's not a good design. The reactors no, I worked on are called pressurized yeah. water reactors. Yeah, they're, 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 they're designed, true. our reactors are here in America are designed to fail properly. If they're called a negative temperature yeah. coefficient reactivity. And so if the, if the water heats up, that means you will have to fight to keep the reactor going. So if something goes wrong and you screw up, what's going to happen? The reactor's going to shut down automatically. Yeah. It's inherently stable. So yeah, Chernobyl was like, but it was cheap. They're Russians, right? <laughs> they they, they didn't a, care. I have a question. Why why is it in, in this country, and this happened a lot in the last election, where you saw uh, it, it's you it's mostly people on the right. They and Trump did it, Trump like pandered to this crowd immensely, the coal industry. Like, we need to bring back our coal jobs. We need to bring back you know what I'm saying? Like there's this, I don't know if it's nostalgia or there's this this fear of moving on from that like talking about getting back into the coal industry i think it's just going backwards like wh why that push it clean in? burning coal it's clean burning it burns burns clean <laughs> um well ridiculous. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Burning, clean burning coal <laughs> without being too insulting i guess trump just relates to it i mean he's a bit of a fossil himself 
you know what? That's the thing. He doesn't even like. He knows that'll get him votes. So he goes out and he puts on a miner's hat and he he acts like yeah. he's digging coal and like he doesn't give a fuck about the coal industry. Uh, you it's know, just, it, thinks he probably gets the money out of it somehow. But the thing, no, there are more I, yeah, coal industry than ever. Right, and that's the thing that he like. He's pushing a an industry that is being replaced by better, cleaner ways of doing it, and he doesn't understand that. He doesn't think about that aspect of it. He's not thinking about what he's actually pushing. He just sees uh, a a group of people that have been you know, sort of pushed out, and he's like, "Oh, this is a, a good opportunity for me to get to get votes." But why are we? Why do we keep pushing back to this this coal industry? Why do we care about the coal industry so much? We need to you move know, on. I think. I don't think it's necessarily coal is the, is the issue he was focusing on. Uh, I mean, it was the issue he was focusing on, but I don't think that's actually what his goal was. The goal is to discredit experts and scientists because clear because that helps him. Um, if you can discredit the scientists and people who know what they're talking about, all you can go to is him. And so then he's going to increase his base a bit because uh, the more uneducated people who he somehow wins over, the better it does for him. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you know that you might find there's a little bit of that going on in there. Um, sure, I can totally see that. I just don't. Yeah, no, he definitely definitely wants the uneducated people. I think that uh, Trump's whole base is considered to be not exactly creme de la creme of the intelligence community. So I, I think that everything he does, he does, and I don't think he does it consciously. I don't think he's smart enough to do it consciously. But I think that he does cater to an audience of people of lesser intelligence that that will believe anything he says for whatever strange reason. And I think you're right. He does have to discredit scientists. I mean, even Mike Pence, who's a younger creationist, he has to discover, he has to, he has to like discredit scientists because he thinks they're 6,000 years old. I get that. I get that it's a, it, it centers around jobs. Like, yes, there, there are a lot of people that were affected by the coal industry going under. And um, like, to me, it seems like you would put, instead of, Putting forth the uh, the effort and money and uh, programs and resources into revitalizing a dead industry like the coal industry, you could use those resources to retrain the people who were in the coal industry to do something different. Maybe in a, in the uh, you know renewable uh, energies um, careers or whatever, train them to to do something different instead of trying to resurrect this gray corpse from the dead. For for what? I mean, for what? <laughs> it just uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, okay, so that was the last uh, question that that I had. Steve, do you have anything uh, that you want to tell him? Because then I, I guess for the next couple of minutes, I want to talk about what um, you're actually going into uh, to do with with meteorology. Then. Yeah, let me tell you, everything got wrong so far. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, the only thing I would add to it, um, there was, uh, by the way, there are a couple other carbon um, gases. You said there was five. I think there's a couple others, like uh, sodium hexafluoride oh. and nitrix, nitrous oxide, or something. But, but anyways, um, so I, I, I really want to ask you about this question because somebody, somebody actually, I, I think, brought it up earlier, and, and this is something that I think that does add to global warming to another extent of the anthropogenic gases, but I think it does have some kind of uh, effect overall. Is the short and long term solar cycles? So what do you think about that having – now, again, I think that anthropogenic is the primary cause, but I think that is not without excluding the fact that there is some kind of solar influence, uh, whether it be the long-term solar cycle, the short-term cycle, solar cycle, that has to play a part somewhat in the overall climate schema. Okay, so when you say solar cycles, you're meaning the increase and decrease in, in the amount of light that the sun produces on a regular basis. You have, you have, you have, when you have a higher solar, solar thing, you have more distribution and higher – power density of energy coming from the sun, of course, is that's going to cause a thermal uh, heating. You have more kinetic energy. Temperatures go up. Yeah. You know what? I, I actually don't know uh, what part of the cycle we're in right now. Um, I do know that uh, we are currently, we are supposed to be uh, getting colder due to where we are, uh, the way our orbit is changing right now. Um, we are supposed to be getting colder because of that, um, but we are getting hotter. So, if you were to say that anth uh, anthropogenic climate change is not real, in that case, you would have to definitely have a really massive uh, surge in power being released by the sun. Um, mm. uh, do you ha do you happen to know on hand uh, what the um, the status of the sun years. is right now? 
well, there's 11 year solar cycle, 20 year solar cycle. And I think there's like a 50,000 million year solar cycle. Um, I have, I usually used to check Soho quite frequently. And so I, especially I like ham radio and I, you know, I, I occasionally look at stuff like that, but I, I haven't seen a real like big X class flare um, in quite some time. Usually they'll rate these things and they'll say, okay, um, there's been an X class class flare. And there's so in, three days later, if there's a coronal mass ejection of some type, it'll actually hit. And then you would have some kind of disruption of the satellite communication or the power grids. I haven't seen really any activity. Matter of fact, sunspot activity has been pretty low, at least the last time I checked, which was several months ago. But um, I don't think there's been a lot of activity on the sun, has there? Now, maybe they can we talk about that the live chat right now? For, for a second, too. Um, like, sure. that brings up a, an interesting uh, other outside of climate change, but this would be a catastrophic event if this happened. If there was a, uh, uh, a CME that was um, powerful enough to knock the grid out. What in the hell would we do? Stone Age? You asking me? Uh, you know, anyone? No, I'm just saying, like, yeah, this, well, it, there's no real right or wrong answer. This is just something that we have to think about. Like, if we if we couldn't have access to anything electronic, if you're you couldn't access your bank account, um, stores couldn't check you out for for food, no, no power works. What in the hell would we do? Honestly, a lot of things are shielded. Here's the thing with the CME: you would have to have a very, 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 very powerful CME, and most things have some kind of shielding. Um, I don't think it would be as detrimental as you think. I think it'd, you know there'd be some capacitors that go out, you know, some transformers or whatever. Um, but it would have to be extremely powerful to cause that amount of damage nationwide, where you would have just a complete catastrophic failure. I think the thermal energy would be a lot more worse than, than that. <laughs> yeah, and it would have to overpower the um, uh, the magnetic field that we have as well. At the same time, that's, so yeah, it would have to be pretty pretty damn massive. I mean, it has happened in the past. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the fear, though. The fear is that you know they're they're saying that the poles are switching, right? The the right magnetic and all that. So there's a shift in the uh, in that, and that if we could be vulnerable for something like a CME to cause that kind of damage if it were to happen within the uh, parameters of that shift. And that to me just sounds like that's just a nightmare awesome. scenario. That's a nightmare scenario. At the same time, Yellowstone could just go off at any time as well. It's true. No, I, you know, I don't, yeah. I, you know what? I don't, think Cal I don't think the caldera in Yellowstone is actually as critical as people think it is. It, it goes up every 600, some odd thousand years, 640,000 years. And yeah, past due. the last thing I just think, no, it's past due. It's 40,000 years past due. But the, I think the magma chambers are such that they don't think it's actually going to be erupting time soon. I think the bigger events really? are going to be mapped fast. Here, here's my predictions for volcanic activity. Um, this is me hanging out with Landon, who's a volcanist. Um, I think that Mount Shasta has a very good chance of being uh, something that goes up being next. Um, there's a couple Sorry. of... Uh, I can you see it just erupting Sprite? <laughs> 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 um, there's a couple of other um, lava fields that are up north in California that uh, may have lava, you know, lava activity. Um, and there's... A, 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 what is it? The um, oh man, uh, there's one. See, I disagree with Stephen. I, I, I don't know. Had, had, uh, I don't think is a big one. Stephen and I have had a debate yeah. on this before. I disagree. I'll, I'll, me and you just personally on the um, the uh, Yellowstone issue. Uh, it's it like a year ago, me and you, not on the show, but like in just text talking about the Yellowstone thing. Yeah, I disagree. Well, I mean, I, I, you think it's going to go up and when? When do you think it's going to go? Um, uh, probably Sunday, if I had to. Yes, <laughs> at 3 a.m. No, I think we got a couple of I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying it's, it's imminent because I think we're, we're so far. Like it's had such a, a you know, a, a schedule almost like the, the times that it has gone off have been s relatively similar in their in their time frame. It's you know, it's not there's did not a fluctuation. Where they were, did you read about the plan where they, they, they were thinking about going in there and venting some of the, the pressure manually? <laughs> I think oh, they a do good that. Idea. How would they well, do that? Just something they were, I don't know, but that's one of the things they were coming up with. And they they were looking at the mound, the the, the the there's a dome there, right? And so they can see if the if the whole thing has been raising up and it's just it's not really changing. So they here's don't the think thing, there's any, here's, here's, the, here's the thing for Christians, like if you if you make the argument that um that this world was designed perfectly for uh for life and that uh we uh, you know God created this plant just just perfect for us to to inhabit that's not the case we could get we could get blown <laughs> off this thing 
at any second by any number of things. Yellowstone, asteroids from uh, space, coronal mass ejections. We are in, we are in harm's way. Gamma ray burst, baby. Gamma ray uh, burst. That's my favorite. We are in harm's way of uh, climate uh, change. <laughs> Freeze, uh, freezing. This planet was not made for, especially for life. We just happened to find uh, the ability to to uh, sustain ourselves on. It. But it's been a struggle. I mean, if you look throughout history, it's been a struggle to make that happen. So um, I don't think it's, it's not a good argument. Anyway, Ben, go ahead. Oh, uh, what about in particular? Was it about the how you would make every person? What would happen? <laughs> because I had an idea on how you could reduce pressure. In in the, in the volcano, you could drill a really oh, big hole, right? You could drill a really big hole, and then it's kind of, I guess they're really good at knowing where the lava chamber kind of starts. So dig a really deep hole and then stop short of there. Uh, I don't know what you have on the other end, like, you know, you might have a big pit or something. And then you put some explosives down there and you let them off, and then it's going to go a big boom, and then the lava's going to all flood out. It's I probably going to. I don't think you want. I don't know about that. <laughs> explosive in a that doesn't really seem like a good idea to me for some reason. Yeah, I, well, you know, it's like. <laughs> We also went up the aggregate all the way to New York. The lava would get down all the way to Arizona almost. It would not oh. be a good event. Okay. Well, you could dig a really yeah. big hole. <laughs> if, like, I, I, my, my, my solution would be to move the hell away from that area. You know, just don't. I wouldn't live there. Here's the thing. Like, I don't know why, why human beings have this need to say, Fuck you to Mother Nature because every time Mother Nature will win, every single time. And these people that build these houses on the 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 hill, you know the hillsides of these volcanoes and or the base of these volcanoes, and they're surprised when the volcano goes boom and covers everything in burning hot lava. Everybody's like, oh, you know, what did you expect to happen? Of course, the volcano is going to go off. That's what volcanoes do. They go boom. Don't build houses on well, the side of volcanoes. If they're active, yeah. I mean, like, uh, I mean, when Mount Penitoba went up uh, back in the nineties, I mean, that I think that killed quite a few people that lived within, you know, like ten miles from it. Um, but like Mount Suvius, I wouldn't live around. The, I mean, that's <laughs> you got to be out of your mind, man. You look over and you see this steaming thing of a uh, of, of volcano in Vesuvius. Malsu people actually walk up to the rim. I mean, rim, you can actually go toward it. And you're standing over there, and this thing's like, you know, belching gas and crap like that. I'm like, no, yeah. no, not going to happen. Don't live in Oklahoma. Move from Oklahoma. That's Oklahoma actually where my house is going. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Tell them, tell them not to go to Oklahoma. <laughs> that, thing, that, place, that place gets fucked up with tornadoes. It, like, last weekend, um, that's, one touched down. Going there. Well, they're going there to study at the university there, but they're also going to do some storm chasing because that's you just got to. I'm fascinated by tornadoes. I would storm yes. chase. I would, I would. I would. Might almost consider that. I really find tornadoes to be fascinating. I, I do, they are, and, but why do they always hit mobile homes. Like always, every story you see. Last week, I was watching the uh, watching the. That has good aim. A a tornado came down in the middle of a uh, a trailer park. That's like. There are hotels and buildings all the way around it. It lands right in the middle of the... It's, out, the, it's uh, like Oklahoma. They're all trailer parks. <laughs> a friend of mine actually yeah. had the idea. A friend of mine actually had the idea. We need to make decoy trailer parks so that we can get all the tornadoes Ooh, to, to hit the decoy trail, trailer parks. And then they all get pooped out and nobody gets hurt. It's a good idea. Good I've never seen a tornado, but I've seen a water spout, which actually technically is a tornado, um, but it's very low velocity. Um, still mess you up, but uh, I've seen those out at sea, but I've never seen a land tornado. Although I've, yeah. I think I've seen cyclonic activity. Yeah. Something's got to change, though, because, I mean, like, if you look, uh, there's projections of uh, Florida that is going to be underwater. Um, oh, yeah. You know, it, that's state. just, that's that's crazy to me to think that, I mean, ugh. modern day Atlanta. Move red, move red. If you can hear wherever he's at, he better like. He, I think might go on and consider relocating. Okay. Um, well, that was a uh, Ben. Thank you for answer. I, I tried to put together the uh, the the questions in a sort of a um, a devil's advocate way or a, a facetious way in asking like you know what's the harm in if if one degree. Just ask these questions that a lot of people. Um, yeah, these are the questions. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so when you say just for the last couple minutes, um, why don't you tell us about what you're 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 studying and what you're going into to do? It's, it's meteorology, right? What do you want to? Yes. Uh, 
What are you going to do well, with it? I actually, I actually want to go into science for the masses. I, I want to do a kind of less Americanized version of Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, kind of a Brian Cox, um, David Attenborough kind of thing. I, I would love to. I love talking about what I'm passionate about, and I kind of. I'm actually kind of using you guys a little bit for this um, <laughs> to get some experience with that kind of thing. And um, yeah, uh, oh, I, I want mean, to go into, sorry. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, I, I want to go into uh, TV work and uh, go into documentary making. Oh, cool. Well, listen, yeah. don't forget about, don't forget about us um, little people. <laughs> you, you make it big. You'll be right and, up uh, there. <laughs> Um, let me, uh, guys. If you have any, um, if you have any questions, you can tag me in it. I'm going to move over to the uh, super chats real quick and um, read those out really fast. Maybe, Steve, you got anything else you want to say while I'm trying to pull? No, this up? people are talking about Dust Devils. I, I, I'm with them. I think Dust Devils are awesome. Uh, they're, they're, that's a totally different type of activity than a tornado, though. Tornadoes do the fact that you have rotating air like the basically like this because you have a higher temperature lower temperature so you have this rotation like this and as it starts going like this it picks up spin spin because of conservation of, of angular momentum that's not the same way a dust devil works at all and so to, you have to have a very hot temperature for dust devils you have you have radiated heat coming up and that's going to cause a vortex but they are very fascinating to, to sit there and just stand to them and you're just like whipping around mm -hmm. and all around you sure yeah. um Sigfrido Sarabia says, uh, was global warming a thing before technology? Um, how is data compared? I'm not sure what well, he means by how is data compared. But climate yeah. change was definitely a thing before technology. Absolutely. Uh, the climate's constantly changing uh, based on factors like uh, phytoplankton algal levels and uh, plant dominance on, on land. Um, just the sun cycle, <laughs> like the sun cycles and uh, the our position in orbit around the sun. And when I say the position, I don't mean what season it is. I mean um, the eccentricity of our orbit because it slightly changes over time. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, climate was constantly changing. However, these are very slow, gradual changes. They change over you know ten thousand years. Um, uh, okay, slightly more than that. Like okay, so it's about like I don't know, like every thousand years, really. It's it's it's. But you know, this is like half a degree we're talking about in that time. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas what we're looking at now is we're looking at. Uh, a bigger change than we've really uh okay not than we've ever seen because it was about minus four degrees uh compared to 1960 20 000 years ago but um it is the most rapid increase in this amount of time that we've ever seen now uh mm -hmm. what was the rest of the question it was um did it exist before technology and yes how do we measure it okay so we measure it using um ice cores and looking at the gas compositions and the bubbles that are trapped in it. We look at it using dendrochronology. So we look at the tree rings and we can so, so we can learn, we know um, the temperature was doing and what uh, the rainfall was doing. Uh, we look at testimony, except that's uh, well, that's a little bit before uh, combustion engines, um, but it only really kicked off when combustion engines were around. So we have a bunch of different methods of doing it. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Trio Monkey six 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 sent two super chats in without a message. Thank you. Again from Sigfrido Serbia. Global warming is the, does global warming exist on Mars or other planets? Um, okay, so one that comes up a lot, I think, is Venus. Um, and people, it seems that people seem to think that Venus is not having global warming right now. Um, the thing is, Venus probably did go through a, a moist global warming event. A long time ago and now you've just got really really hot temperatures it's like i don't know i think i might be completely wrong on this number by the way but i think it's like something like 500 degrees the whole time there all around because the atmosphere is so thick it just stores the the heat so well and the atmosphere is basically just co2 now and so it's just you just can't go there <laughs> it's just awful mm. and actually what i love is mercury uh is actually colder than venus despite being clo closer uh because it, uh, venus's atmosphere is just so ridiculous um, that it's just really good at trapping heat. Um, but Mars, um, you know, I don't know enough about Mars, actually. Um, I would have to look into that, I think. Sure. Fair enough. Uh, Sarah Slaps Chat, Steve stole my clothes. And she's not getting them back. They right. end up on my floor. Want to know? Don't want to know. You don't want to know. 
uh, S. No Winger, uh, Ars and Tony, uh, how aim to limit super chat text in 50? No one limited the super chat text. Jesus Christ, Tony. Is there anything that you don't bitch about? I swear, you must be one of the most miserable human beings I've ever come into contact with. Um, S. Winger says, uh, for Steve's toupee beard fund. <laughs> Kuyasa, is climate change behind why Steve's beard fell out, or is it a correlation yes. for cause? Yes, uh, and it's very hot. Just, <laughs> then, it, if climate change made Steve's beard fall off, what is it going to do to Kyle's hair? We need to stop climate change now. Nothing, because oh, uh, no, will, you, you, oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> no, not. I will, I will have it implanted, sewed on, um, something. I will have hair. Um, there's, there's you're artificial just a man. It'll be just for Kyle. Yeah. That's not happening. Um, Sarah slaps chat. You're going to climate jail. Did you mean hell? My unfinished journey. YouTube has some sort of glitch going on that makes Steve's that makes Steve look clean shaven. Snapchat. Refresh this. Um, and then S Winger, for God's sakes, donate this to get Steve's beard back. I don't think that they. That's the most. It, it's it's funny that in the climate change discussion the most controversial thing was steve's beer <laughs> that's funny okay uh, all I um, well about, you know what uh, all i care about uh, off the hook if you're proof of this that's all that matters if you don't well let me know off it's not hook, bad please. actually yeah it's yes, not bad sir i mean um, i've seen people who've had beards and they if they shave it off it's just awful they need a beard um but you yeah, yeah that no, works yeah not a sorry wrinkle, mike it's it's Winnegar. Sorry, Mike, not 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 Winger. Sorry, um, Mike, I got that. Um, okay, uh, Ben, is there anything else that you want to uh to say? Put out there uh, anywhere people can follow you if they want to learn more or hear more from you, that sort of thing. You know, I'm not really on social media much. Um, I would love to come back here and talk about anything really. I don't know at some other point. Um, so maybe here if you'll have me back. Um, sure. but yeah, I don't Absolutely. really do social media much. No, you're more like a one night stand, man. We would love to have you back. <laughs> Anytime. Awesome. Um, I, I would yeah. love to come. do that. Um, zero one three two one three two says, if uh, is this super chat above fifty characters in length? Is Artis and Tony confused for obvious reasons? Very nicely, well played. Um, <laughs> zero one three two one three two. Explain that, Tony. Um, anyways, that's enough about Tony. Uh, guys, uh, I want to thank Ben once again for uh, joining us. We will definitely be having uh, him back. Uh, don't forget that tomorrow we'll be joined by um, oh, Mike uh, Winnegar says, love you, Kyle Smoochies. Sorry about getting your name incorrect. Thank you for the uh, for giving me the vinegar thing. That's how I can do these names. You just give me something that it, it can rhyme with. I can handle the uh, handle the names like that. Um, Ned will be with us tomorrow. Two Girls, One Mike on Wednesday. Um, Aaron will be with us on Thursday. And then uh, Furry Porn and Noel Plum on Friday. Big week. And uh, this was one hell of a way to uh, to kick it off. And um, I think that's all that I've got. Steve, anything from you? No, um, this was great, actually. Uh, I didn't know what we were going to walk ourselves into here because um, total backstory, Ben had actually joined us before, but it didn't go on air. <laughs> so wasn't quite yeah, was sure my... how this was going to end up. Yeah, that was my fault. I think you, it did great, we... ben. No, you did great, Ben. Oh, I'm proud yeah. of you. Awesome. Three weeks okay. in the making. <laughs> yeah we did it <laughs> yeah we All got right, that yes um this was a fantastic uh show we'll be back tomorrow at uh 9 p.m and uh yeah insert catchy sign off phrase here i'm gonna show this to my mom brilliant yeah hi mom <laughs>